We've never set our competitors as the benchmark we're seeking to achieve. A lot of people in our space set us as the benchmark and try and work out how close they can get to the service that we, that we offer to our end customers. <music>
staff absence that in some areas hit 30% as people went off either with COVID or because someone in the house had COVID. Or if you recall at the early stages, there was so little testing going on that if anyone in the house thought they had a fever or coughed twice, you know, the whole house went into isolation. Um, and so we had to deal with all of that at the same time and the supply chain that became more erratic. So yeah, it was a, it was a challenge. And as, as customers, we often don't appreciate that, what goes on behind the scenes. You just want to get access to food. Um, so I think it's a really important point. We are obviously still in the middle of a, the pandemic in most parts of the world. Um, but when you think about eventually being in a world post-COVID, like, what do you think you're going to take from what you've evolved um, and what you've learned in, in these times to the future? Look, I think the main thing that we've learned and evolved, well, A, you know, we, we've seen how adaptable we are and, and some of the things that we've learned to, to operate because we can't visit sites actually makes us more scalable. Because if you learn how to train people remotely using online training tools, you can now train an infinite number of people, right? Whereas before we used to bring the engineers to one of our existing sites in the UK and kind of have them shadow existing engineers and stuff like that. So some of the things that we've learned will enable us to scale faster in the future. Obviously, what we've learned is, you know, that the, I think the consumer has learned the benefits of online shopping, those that hadn't tried it in grocery. Yes. And I think that's here to stay. It's not like, you know, the amount of takeaways where people would rather go to the restaurant with their friends, but they either aren't allowed to or they feel scared that they might catch a virus. You don't go to see your friends. It's not a social highlight of your week. You know, it, it's actually just a chore that you have to do. And they've learned that someone else will do it for them. And where we can do it for them and actually it costs less than a hypermarket. This is a, you know, this is a fantastic thing. More range, more freshness. Uh, um, and lower cost. So this just helps us and our clients to scale their, their online businesses and achieve faster channel shift than before. Um, and as I say, a number of the things that we've had to learn to do make us more adaptable, make us more flexible, make us able to scale faster because we had to learn how to work around these very, very awkward times. And I think we've also been extremely surprised at how brilliantly not only our teams, but obviously many companies around the world have managed with you know, their office their offices shut and people working from home and people coding from home and people running complex supply chains from home and, and, and you know, complex international building projects from home. And so that has surprised us as well, I would say. When I was looking back at the journey of Ocado, a lot of people won't uh, be aware that you, uh, your first idea was actually LM Solutions. Um, so when did that sort of business idea start to take fold? By... 1999, I'd actually done a stint in London, gone out to Hong Kong, set up the Asian credit trading business there, gone to New York, was part of the high yield business there. And it was 99 and the world was changing very rapidly. You know, internet companies and technology companies were being formed and growing enormously quickly. And the whole sector looked pretty interesting. And so started to think about ideas and eventually left at the beginning of 2000 to set up something that we called LMS, Last Mile Solutions. Um, which in effect is, is uh, where we've come back to today. Uh, in the meanwhile, of course, we rebranded it when we became a grocery retail business because Last Mile Solutions is not very sexy for a, uh, <laughs> an actual trading company uh, with the public. But um, today, you know, Ocado Group's um, smart platform is effectively a, a series of Last Mile Solutions um, and the retail business is clearly Ocado. Uh, so we have done a bit of a... a, a, a a turn but yeah that's how we um that's how we got going at the beginning of 2000. When you were starting out what made you so sure that you know this could work? Well there, there were some businesses in the US that actually were failing spectacularly at the time but <laughs> we we looked at the sector and realized that the sector had gone through transformation many times and I think a lot of people in the UK think that Tesco's was always the largest grocer in the UK and nothing's ever going to change. Actually you know when, when I was born the largest grocer in the UK was Safeway taken over by the co-op, taken over by Sainsbury's, taken over by Tesco's, if I've got that in the right order. Um, and so, you know, Tesco's took over Sainsbury's, I think, when they bought WM Lowe in Scotland in the early 90s. Um, and so, you know, the industry does change, but it largely changed from being a, you know, pre-war, it was a, it was a, a, a counter service industry, as in there was a grocer who, who sat behind the counter. You brought in your own containers and they ladled out the you know, the flour and stuff like that to you. The grocer behind the counter knew you by name, knew something of you, knew what to recommend or what to sell to you. And you then went next door to the green grocer, to the butcher, to the baker, etc. Um, the introduction of self-service changed the industry completely. And then there was the aggregation of the self-service grocer with those other, you know, the butcher, the baker uh, uh, um, and, the, and the green grocer. You know, the industry just changes. And even 
you know, the, even the industry sometimes when they, when this change is staring them in the face still thinks it's just a fad. So the Grocer yeah. magazine that's still like the Bible of our industry wrote at the time that this was this newfangled thing was, you know, a, a, was going to be a minority of grocery shopping would be self-service because the customer liked to stand in the line and talk to the grocer on the other, you know, the other side of the counter. So, um, you know, that, that, that had migrated. You then migrated from the kind of high street, from self-service to the high street supermarket, then from the high street supermarket to the out of town supermarket. So yeah. we knew it could be done. When you look at it, every time the customer was offered more selection at lower prices, and that's what drove them. At the same time though, they had to sacrifice the personalization. So, you know, the hypermarkets of the 1990s, they have no idea who you are. At best, they collect data on your way out the door when you hand them your club card, you know, you know, and they collect to understand what it is you bought, but they have no idea who you are when you go in the store or when you're walking around the aisles. There was no personalization in the conversation with you. Um, and you had to do a lot of the work yourself. Um, whereas if you went back to that counter service store, there was a boy on a bike outside that would cycle the goods back to your house. And so what we'd seen is lower prices, greater ranges, less personalization and worse service. And so what we looked at and thought is that we could use technology and automation to put back in the personalization and the service and actually end up with lower prices and greater ranges. And today we sit here with significantly greater ranges with match prices, not lower at the moment, but match prices to the hypermarket, significantly greater ranges um, massive amounts of personalization uh, and and obviously service that, that, that pre, pre-pandemic pre brought it into your kitchen, but now brings it to your doorstep. I, from, from my own experience, I've been a card shopper for many, many years, but I think it's only until you experience that personalization. I mean, the favorite sort of tab is my favorite thing. I'll be on a work trip and I'll do the food shop from the US and just go straight to favorites because it's just, you, you know what I need to buy. And I think that that's an extraordinary experience as a customer. But I think it's also fair to say it takes time for people to get to that new behavior and understand it. And I'm going to quote you where you did describe Ocado as a 20 year overnight success story. So as, as well as having the confidence to make the bet, because obviously, it, rightly, as you rightly say, the industry has continued to change, but let's be honest, not that quickly. How did you stay patient? How did you keep going? Because clearly it has taken time for everybody else to see that opportunity. Look, I think that for many years, we could see the opportunity. We were growing, the customer feedback was phenomenal. The profitability was, you know, the, the path to profitability was, was apparent to us. So we weren't, um, you know, we weren't just trying to do something. And it wasn't a case of the customers loved it, but we were hemorrhaging money with no plan how to make it. Um, you know, but both sides were relatively clear, but it was not well understood. And as well as not being well understood, I think there were vested parties who tried to muddy the water and tried to make it look like it could never work and, and wanted it to never work. And so when we joked, um, you know, after that the, the, we became one of the best performing stocks on the stock market type of thing in the UK, um, you know, still small relative to successes in the US, but we joked about the overnight success story, you know, 20 year overnight success story, because <laughs> yeah. it took 20 years for people to say, actually, what you're doing is what the industry needs to do. For many years, people just thought we were spending money and it was foolish money. Um, and actually, you know, it's a... 7.6 trillion pounds a year global grocery market that can dramatically transform itself. I, I reckon that a third of that money is spent um, between the suppliers and, and the customers in terms of uh, property, people, uh, energy and food waste, because those are the four constituents it takes to sell groceries. Um, and so if you think there's a global market that's spending two, two and a half uh, trillion pounds a year on those assets to distribute groceries to customers. And you think that if I apply significant amounts of intelligence, um, big data, robotics, automation, you can dramatically reduce that amount of money. There's clearly a massive business opportunity there. What's been interesting about our conversation today, um, you're incredibly humble about what you've achieved. You sort of go quite matter of fact about a lot of what's happened. But what I have really heard is, you know, how resilient you are as a person and sort of how resilient your business is that you've built. Like, where does that come from? Because you sort of it's almost you sort of don't talk about it, but it's so strongly clearly inside of you that you sort of take on all these challenges and just sort of rise to the challenge. 
I mean, I, I don't know where it comes from, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's just, it's a challenge and you just have to see the other side of it. And, and, a, and a challenge is an opportunity. And, and that's just in, I guess it's in my nature. And then it feeds down through the organization because that's tends to be how kind of culture and, and stuff feeds down from the top of an organization. I'd like to touch on competitors because you touched on how much money is in this sector, which is a huge amount. So how do you make sure that you do continue to stay ahead? Because no doubt there are a lot of very well-funded competitors coming after you. So look, one of the things that we've always done, and obviously you can never be 100% certain that you're going to remain at the forefront, but we've never looked at our competitors and said, okay, they do A, B and C, we need to do A, B and C and D, or we need to do A, B and C a little bit better than them. We've never set our competitors as the benchmark we're seeking to achieve. A lot of people in our space set us as the benchmark and try and work out how close they can get to the service that we that we offer to our end customers. Um, but we've always looked at what are the customers ultimately want? What is the best that we could possibly imagine being and how close can we get to that? And then every time we achieve something, we just set a new target. So we're very, uh, um, we're, you know, we're never satisfied and we're very restless. And so, you know, if we have a target to get to 100, when we get to 90 and 100 in sight, we move the target to 120. So we rarely hit a target because if we're getting anywhere close, we clearly didn't set it you know, hard, uh, hard enough. Um, and so, you know, despite now being in a very good position and we could sit here and try and monetize our position, we're actually, you know, investing more money than we've ever invested be before in research and development to continue to innovate and continue to remain at the forefront of what we do. So we're up to, for grocery retail business or a technology business supplying grocery retail, it's quite a large number. We're up to about two and a half thousand uh, research and development engineers now. Um, you know, constantly working out how to make the shopping experience easier for our clients' customers um, or um, make the business more economically, uh, 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 you know, cheaper to operate for our clients. I always believe great tech is basically behind the scenes. It's enabling the experience. And I think that's what you do so brilliantly at Cardo. So you really have evolved the business to be truly a global tech platform. And as you touched on working with clients as well, as well as obviously your customers. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, at what point did you really evolve into being even more focused on, on the tech uh, side at, at scale? So look, when we started the business up, um, and I started it with some, uh, uh, well, a friend and a former friend from Goldman Sachs, we thought that we would put the constituents together. So we would, um, you know, hire some tech experts, some logistics experts, some retail experts. We would bring the financial knowledge and we would just put the whole thing together and it would kind of be relatively easy to do. Um, we, we learned very quickly that that wasn't the case. Um, and we, we, you know, our tech journey started by doing what most big retailers do today, which is, you know, go out to... Um, and uh, uh, you know the likes of a Cap Gemini or an Accenture or an IBM, and say I want to do something that looks like this, either looks like a Cardo is what people would say today, or or in our case, you know, we kind of outline what it was we wanted it to do, and then they say you need to buy these fifteen best of breed packages, and we can you know you can spend tens of millions of pounds customizing them and tens of millions of pounds uh, uh, integrating them. So we started out in that kind of space, but quickly realised that even these best of breed software packages were not actually good for the grocery industry. The grocery industry is too high a volume uh, compared to anything else that's going on out there. And it's too unusual in people's purchasing habits in terms of they keep repeat purchasing things that you generally don't do outside of grocery. Um, and so we quickly learned that it didn't really work very well. And we started to therefore grow our own capabilities and develop our own software. And soon we, you know, within a space of years, we had written out all of the external software other than the kind of core databases and things like that. And we were running an end-to-end -end software platform. Um, by the time that, you know, Steve Jobs announced on the iPhone 3 that third parties could write apps for an iPhone, we started that day to write an app and launch the first physical shopping app on the iPhone um, with our Ocado on the go app. And I think, you know, you could buy your groceries from us on an iPhone before you could buy an iPhone on an iPhone. Um, and so, you know, we just got good at doing this type of stuff. Whatever it is, seven or so years ago, we decided to take the leap and go into the actual uh, um, automation robotics space ourselves. 
And since then, we started, you know, we've become one of the largest robotic businesses in, in the UK now. Um, and we build the insides of the warehouses uh, from scratch, from, you know, from components. And even some of the components we've had to design because the capability of available components, particularly in comms, for example, where in our warehouses, we have thousands of robots that we need to have two-way confirmed communication with 10 times a second. And there was nothing available in the comms field from all the traditional people you'd expect to find it from that was capable of handling that volume of calls. So we sat down with some scientists to work out whether we were kind of break, wanting to break the laws of physics or it just hadn't been done before. And it was the latter. And so, you know, we developed and patented and, and, and have done that as well and all of it so that we can pick groceries faster. Huge thank you from all your customers and thank you for showing us the power of technology. Thanks very much for your time. Really enjoyed being here.